In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about the data directory, vacuum features, binary performance, and network latency. I'm Creston Jamison, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 114. All right, I hope you, your family, and coworkers continue to do well throughout these times. Our first piece of content is new PostgreSQL releases 12.3, 11.8, 10.13, 9.6.18, and 9.5.22 are released. The only security issue relates to the Windows installer, and it was running executables from uncontrolled directories. So if you run a Windows, maybe you want to upgrade faster. Otherwise, there are over 75 bug improvements so I would probably kind of look through this list to see if there's any reason you want to upgrade relatively quickly. And this is from the uh, postgresql.org website. There's also this post that was done on Devrim Gundes' PostgreSQL blog that says, uh, Yum users, some hyphen development RPMs require new repository. So it's a, he says if you're using Red Hat Enterprise Linux, CentOS, 7, then development sub-packages in 11 and 12 require an extra repo enabled for LLVM and Clang. So he says you just need to update this for CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You need this command. So just something to keep in mind if you use those versions. The next piece of content is don't manually modify the PostgreSQL data directory. And this is from uh, the Robert Haas blog on blogspot.com. And this is a big no-no. Unless you have actually done PostgreSQL development, I would probably never modify anything in the data directory. And what's interesting, a lot of people, when he gives this recommendation, he says, really, what if I do X, Y, and Z? Don't do it, just don't do it. And he says, in 100% of cases, my answer is that it's not safe. But going back to, hey, what if I do this? He kind of goes through this post on what happens if you do it. So for example, if you remove the Postmaster PID, there's a chance, of course, you're going to be running multiple versions of that same PostgreSQL cluster that could lead to who knows what kind of effects. And he says, if you suspect it's present without Postgres running, assume that you're wrong. Because <laughs> he says in his uh, 20 or so years, he's never really seen it happen that way. So definitely something not to do. Uh, removing wall files is another big no-no because people look, at least in older versions of PostgreSQL, the wall files were stored in the pgx log directory. So people assume, hey, these are logs, I can delete them. No, <laughs> they're part of the wall and they've actually renamed it to pgwall in recent versions because you don't want to delete these because this helps with crash recovery and maintaining consistency of your database. And there's all sorts of ill effects he goes through that can happen here, but he says instead of removing files manually from pgwall, Consider why the system is, say, keeping so many of these around. So he says maybe you have a failing archive recovery command. Maybe you're just not keeping up with a rate of wall generation. I've had like slow disks that could cause this type of thing. Do you have a existing replication slot or an orphan replication slot that is preventing the walls segments from being removed? Maybe you have long running transactions or maybe you have your uh, max wall size or wall keeps segments are really high preventing them being removed. So again, these are things you can fix without having to change things in the data directory. Next one he covers is removing files from the PG uh, transact directory, the xact directory. He covers a uh, PG multi transact directory. Talks about uh, trying to do single page restores, which has a large degree of risk he communicates here and all the types of things that can go wrong. So if you're interested, I definitely su suggest checking it out. And then there's a section on is manual modification of the data directory ever justified? And again, if you are in a corrupt state in certain cases, again, very few where this is perhaps warranted. But again, I would leave that to an expert, leave it to someone who has done PostgreSQL development and knows exactly what they're doing. He makes it a comparison to a surgery. So essentially you want to find a surgeon to do this. You don't want to just willy nilly go in and try changing things because you'll probably make things worse. So this was a great post uh, if you've ever considered modifying the data directory. Basically, just don't do it. Uh, so definitely a post I suggest you to check out. The next post is improved vacuum and auto vacuum in PostgreSQL 13. 
And this is from Amit Kapila's blog at blogspot.com. Improvement number one is vacuum will be allowed to process indexes in parallel. This is huge. And where it does it in parallel is the indexes. And the indexes, in my experience, take the longest part of vacuum. And you can do various configuration settings looking at the uh, max parallel maintenance workers, min parallel index scan size to be able to configure it so that you are indexing in parallel. And it looks like this will be the default. So that's good for doing auto vacuum as well, but you can specify the number of workers when you're gonna do a manual vacuum. So this is a great, great improvement coming in 13. Improvement number two is allow inserts to trigger auto vacuum activity. So again, by default, when you just have inserts, there's nothing really to vacuum up in terms of deleted rows in a table or updated rows if all you're getting is inserts. And the first vacuum that's gonna be is an anti-wraparound vacuum, which will probably take a really long time and potentially use more resources to do it. You can't cancel it. So there's some disadvantages to it, but with some configurations that they've introduced, it will trigger a vacuum once so many inserts are done into a table so that you can do some general cleanup, such as freezing rows and assuring heap pages are uh, visible and also allow uh, index only scans to skip heap fetches. So being able to do this vacuum is important for those reasons. Improvement number three is allow auto vacuum to display additional information about the heap and index in case of an error. So this is good that it can actually tell you where particular errors are if vacuum runs into a problem. Now. Knock on wood, I haven't experienced this, but this would be this reporting would be good to have in case it happens. Improvement number four, auto vacuum will now log wall usage statistics along with other information. So this is great to understand how many things like a full page images are used and things of that nature. Improvement five, make vacuum buffer counts 64 bits wide to avoid overflow of buffer usage stats. So this will just make the stats accurate as opposed to invalid. So that's a good benefit. And then six is add wait event vacuum delay to report on cost-based vacuum delay. So he says uh, this will help us to monitor the auto vacuum throttling. So a lot of great features in coming 13 to vacuum. So especially this parallel. So if you want to learn more about it, definitely check out this blog post. The next piece of content is binary data performance in PostgreSQL. So this post covers performance using uh, binary data types in PostgreSQL. Now they cover three ways that you can do this. One is storing the data in files and then storing a reference to that file. And these have advantages and disadvantages. Disadvantages is that consistency is not guaranteed. Like when you write the file, when you put the record in the database, those are gonna be misaligned. Benefits are the database is small and the performance can usually be very fast because reading directly from the file system is better. Next option is storing the data in large objects. This is an older way of storing binary data in PostgreSQL. Now it's the slowest, but it does have advantage in that you can store arbitrarily large data with large objects. And the API has support for streaming. So you can read and write large data in chunks. The third option is storing data as a byte A data type. And that's the new way of storing binary data. Now it says the main disadvantages are there's an absolute limit of one gigabyte and all the data has to be stored in memory. There's no streaming support. And he says with byte A, this basically uses toast to be able to store that data. So it stores it separately from the table. Now, along with this, because normally PostgreSQL compresses large data being stored, you can avoid that by setting the storage to external for your byte A data type. So for example, here setting this to ex external, it actually avoids the compression. So if you're already compressing it, use the external here to avoid trying to compress it again. Next, they talk about a Java implementation they did to test out the speeds of these different solutions. And they come up with a table at the bottom here that show using the file system directly for two different data size types, you can see that's the fastest. But again, the disadvantage is inconsistency. Uh, the large objects, pretty darn slow, but it has support for streaming. And then the byte A data type, faster than large objects, but nowhere near the speed of the file system. And then in the summary here, they talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each type. So if you're wanting to store binary data in PostgreSQL, definitely check out this post so you can make the best choice for what you're choosing to do. And I should mention this is from cybertech-postgresql.com. The next post, also from cybertech-postgresql.com, is 
PostgreSQL network latency does make a big difference. So here they wanted to test performance with increased latency. So they're using a tool called tcconfig to configure latency in Linux and then using pgbench to set up some transaction tests. So running at full speed with no latency introduced, you get 8,813 transactions per second. When introducing 10 milliseconds of delay and then running the same benchmark, it drops to 461 transactions per second. So a huge drop off. So essentially these are clients waiting for their results to come in and before they send the next, next transaction, that type of latency of 10 milliseconds can result in that. And then if you bump it up to 50 milliseconds, now your TPS is at 88. Basically it dropped over a hundred times. So network latency is hugely important. And they mentioned specifically here for online transaction processing, because you have a lot of small, short transactions, any latency you introduce from wherever the client is to the server is going to significantly decrease your transactions that you can execute per second. So definitely an interesting blog post showing you how latency can impact your queries. The next post is Postgres distinct on, and this is from John Noonmaker. Com. And this was an interesting post because he's a developer and he walks through a problem he was having with performance and how he wanted to fix an N plus one query to get better performance. So this talks a lot about Ruby as well as the SQL he used to solve his problem. Basically the solution he chose as the most efficient one is using distinct on to pull up the first record that he needed. And then he goes through his Ruby implementation of how he introduced this query into his code to get the best performance. So if you're interested in a developer's perspective of seeing a problem and coming up with a solution using distinct on, definitely check out this blog post. The next post, overcoming imposter syndrome, working with PostgreSQL's SSL modes. This is from richyen.com. And he's talking about all the different SSL modes that are available in PostgreSQL. Now, what determines what uses SSL or not from the server's perspective is the pghpa conf file. So however, in that first column you have it set will determine whether SSL is used. Now, local uses a Unix domain socket, so it's not going to use any SSL at all. Using host, it could use SSL or it could not. Using host SSL, it only uses SSL, and then using host no SSL means don't use SSL with this. Now, convenient way to reject all non-SSL traffic is to put this in the top line of your PGA HPA comp file, basically for host no SSL for all databases, users, IP addresses, reject it. So basically reject all no SSL connection attempts. And then you would need to put in a host SSL line for others wishing to connect. So this is how you enforce it on the server side. Now there's also an SSL mode on the client. So that dictates how the client connects. So it can prefer SSL, it can require it, it can disable it. There's also some certificate verifications. So here he goes through the different ones. So he set up the server as described. It's rejecting, rejecting all non-SSL. It's saying only use SSL with connecting with a password. The first attempt here where the SSL mode of a client was disabled, it rejects it. It won't work because the client has said, I don't want to use SSL, but the server says, no, I'm only going to use SSL. So the connection doesn't work. The connections are permitted through when the SSL mode is allow for the client. It works if it's preferred for the client or it works if it's required. However, you'll notice that verify CA fails as well as verify full fails. And this is where you're asking for the client to verify the certificate used by the server. So this will only work if you have set up and manually installed certificates on the server and the clients trust the certificate authority who signed those certificates. Verify CA basically means verify the CA who signed the certificate of the server you're using. Verify full means you're also verifying that the common name or the server alternative name that is in the certificate matches the database server that you're trying to connect to. So basically, this is the strongest way of verifying authenticity that you're not connecting to a server that's not what you expect. So if you're wanting to learn more about these settings, definitely check out this post. The next piece of content is benefits of external key management system over the internal and how they could help securing PostgreSQL. 
So this is talking about the benefits of an external key management system. Now, why are we talking about this? This is because this organization, HiGo.ca, from this blog post, is working on a transparent data encryption feature. This is where data gets encrypted at rest by the PostgreSQL server. Now, in order to do that, they mentioned that encryption is relatively simple, but what is not is key management. So they're working on this transparent data encryption feature potentially for version 14, and they're talking about having some internal key management features for it, but they're going through and talking about this post from the benefits of an external key management feature. So if you're wanting to learn more about the benefits of this, you may want to check out this post from hygoca.com. The next post, keep your libraries updated and nobody gets hurt. This is from secondquadrant.com. They're talking about the importance of keeping all your libraries up to date even when running PostgreSQL because PostgreSQL relies on a number of libraries. And if those aren't kept up to date, you could run into problems and issues. And they go over not upgrading may give you a false sense of stability because things are fine and you may have a fear of upgrading, but eventually you're going, probably going to run into issues and it's usually related to an old software version that hasn't been updated. So they go into some actual scenarios where say someone was using a PG dump, but then they discovered that it had a PG audit extension that hadn't been updated in more than a year and it was resulting in an error when trying to restore the database. So that's a big issue. The next scenario they're talking about where they had a huge performance difference when trying to do a post GIS query and they tracked it down to an issue with an old glibc version. So once that was updated, the performance went back to normal. So it's basically communicating the importance of doing updates to your system, not just your PostgreSQL versions, but also this extra libraries that potentially PostgreSQL is using. The next post is Multi-column partitioning, and this is from embina-learnings at blogspot.com. And this is a way of partitioning tables using multiple columns. And I actually didn't know this was possible, where you can create a table and have different columns and looking in different ranges. So if you look at this here, it's like a range from 1 to 20, and from 110 to 200, and from 50 to 200. And this goes through all the possibilities and things to watch out for and how queries work when using multiple columns for your partitioning. Now, I haven't encountered a use case for this, but this was definitely an interesting blog post you may want to check out in case you have a use case for it. The next post is PG Badger, X-ray vision for your queries. This is from enterprisedb.com, and they're basically talking about using PG Badger to analyze your logs. And they go through some of the things you may want to additionally configure in postgresql.conf in order to make sure you're collecting the most information. And it shows you how to walk through and how can you use PG Badger to analyze your log. So if you're interested in doing that, check out this blog post. The next post is key parameters and configuration for streaming replication in Postgres 12. So in this example, they're looking up setting up a primary server with two replicas and you can choose to have them synchronous or not, and they're using uh, replication slots, and they describe the settings that need to be made on the primary and the replicas. So if you're interested in setting this up for your system, you can check out this blog post, also from enterprisedb.com. The next post is fuzzy searching with PostgreSQL, and this is from a Dev2 website, and it's talking about trigrams, basically. So using the PG trigram extension to do fuzzy searches or similar like searches in your database. Now this goes over just a very basic implementation of it and how you could use it. It doesn't cover things such as adding indexes and things of that nature, but if you want to get a good basic description of using the PG trigram extension, definitely check out this blog post. The next piece of content is advanced SQL and database books and resources. This is from neilwithdata.com. And we had previously talked about other books that were presented as educational resources. And here he goes into several different online courses and books for you to boost your knowledge of SQL. Again, this is not necessarily PostgreSQL specific, but a number of his resources, of course, talk about PostgreSQL. The next post is build PostgreSQL and extension on Windows. And it tells you how you can build Postgres along with extensions in Windows. So if you have a need to do that, check out this post from hygo.ca. And the last post is that the PostgreSQL Person of the Week is 
Fabrizio de Roy's Mello. Forgive me if I pronounced your name incorrectly. So if you want to learn more about Fabrizio and his contributions to PostgreSQL, definitely check out this blog post. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode. Or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.